Ladies and gentlemen, Namaskar. A very warm welcome to the 16th edition of Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by the tall Banega Swast India at Darbar Hall. This session is presented by Business Standard. We are delighted here to present the session, How Economics Abandoned the Poor. Lord Meghna Desai, academic, Padma Bhushan awardee and former labor politician takes a critical introspective look at the bodies of thought that have driven economics across the world. In his recent book, The Poverty of Political Economy, How Economics Abandoned the Poor, Desai asks imperative questions about the reinvention of policies and their formations, insisting that humanity return to, this, to the discipline of economics. In conversation with academic Shlendra Raj Mehta, a specialist in microeconomic theory, Desai discusses the contribution of economics in politics and where they fell short. We welcome on stage Meghna Desai. Meghna Desai is an economist by profession and taught at the London School of Economics for 40 years. He is a keen observer of British politics and participates in it from his perch in the House of Lords. He has written books on economics, Marxism, Islamist terrorism, Ezra Pound and Bollywood. His latest book is The Poverty of Political Economy, How Economics Abandoned the Poor and the discussion is around this book. Shailendra Raj Mehta is the president director and distinguished professor of innovation and entrepreneurship at MICA in Ahmedabad. Earlier, he headed Oro University and Ahmedabad University after having stints at the Duke CE and the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad and Purdue University. Thank you and over to you, Shilaj. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. You know, I'm an economist, as is Lord Desai. And uh, the book that we're going to discuss today, The Poverty of Political Economy, How Economics Abandoned the Poor, is, if you will, and let me hold it up here, it's a master class in the history of economic ideas. I wish, I wish I had this in my own graduate work in economics. Because not only does he talk about all the greats that have made economics great or not so great today, he talks about all of them, but he also gives wonderful stories, you know, which are woven around those authors. And most importantly, and that is where I'd like to start today, he contextualizes each one of those authors that these ideas did not originate in a vacuum, but that they were very much products of their time. So as a result, we should not take them, as we often do, as iron laws, right? Like the laws of gravitation, which are invariant across time and space, but rather that they are very much products of their historical struggle, if you will. And only when you understand that struggle do you realize the import of those ideas. And that is also where you will see why almost all of these, in fact, why almost all, every one of the ideas that we're going to discuss is flawed. And that it has a certain utility for its time. But if, we, but if you extend it, then it's a little bit like a guest who has overstayed. So uh, just to set the context, and I made a list of all the thinkers that he covers in this book. Let me just run through that list. He starts, of course, with um, Colbert, uh, the French economist who coined the term laissez-faire. Do you want to talk about where that term comes from? Why did he coin that term? Colbert, Colbert yeah. and uh, laissez-faire. Why yeah. does he coin that term? You see, uh, in the 17th century, uh, 18th century, uh, movement of goods from one district to another was very much like VAT was in India until GST was invented. Mm. 
you know, when, when any, any truck went from Delhi to Bombay, it had to stop about 57 times. And every, every city, and every district and so on, and had to pay a tax. And that was the situation at that time. And so very often, if there was a famine in one part of France, you couldn't move goods and grain from one part to another part because you had to be stopped. That is when Colbert sort of said, laissez passer, laissez faire. Laissez faire, laissez passer. Let, let, let us do what we want to do, laissez passer, let us pass. And that is how modern economies were born, where goods can flow freely from one to another. Now, of course, we've got e-commerce, but that's another story. So, so goods but, flowing freely from, e from one place to another, that became the metaphor for free markets, if you will. By the way, parenthetically, I should point out, uh, since I've been working on some of these ideas, by contrast, this free movement of goods and even ideas, especially ideas, is something that the Indian tradition values greatly because Kautilya in his Arthashastra uh, talks about that. And there are some of the most beautiful descriptions of the actual functionings are from about a thousand years ago, uh, from around 1000 uh, AD or so. Uh, the epigraphic inscriptions, detailed page-long descriptions of economic arrangements and how goods were moving freely from one part of India to another. It's one of those things that uh, modern economists should look at, not just from the point of view of India, uh, but globally. So the um, thinkers that you touch upon, and it's quite a list, starting from Colbert, of course, Adam Smith, Malthus, Ricardo, Mill, Bentham, Marx, Pigou, Marshall, Samuelson, Keynes, Friedman, and so on. Pretty much every great is covered. And I'm going to take... <laughs> so, but I'm going to take a quote from, if I, and by the way, I, I, I have done my homework. It's, it's um, thumbed and read and underlined and I've taken post-it notes and posted them. And one of the most striking notes is on page 195, and I'm going to read this to you, and I want you to comment. That English political economy was a defense of the landed elite against a mob threatening democratic change. In some sense, if I were to find a light motif for your book, this is the thread that basically connects I think at least half of the thinkers that I've just listed. Would you care to talk about that? Yeah, you see, in a sense, I was, I found this partly by introspection, partly by reading during the uh, lockdown. I was in lockdown, I was at home, you know, my food was being delivered, my, I, I couldn't go out and House of Lords was online. So what am I going to do? So I thought, let me try and find an idea, why do economists think? that cutting income tax for the rich is good and cutting benefits for the poor is good. Mm. You know, there, there must be a problem because we were at that time. So I said, start with Adam Smith, where else do you go? And then I discovered reading Malthus and that connected with the French Revolution. Malthus was writing a few years after Adam Smith, but the French Revolution had happened and the French mob was Mm. abolishing monarchy, challenging landlords, and you know, that, that was an uptick. And there were people in London from France welcoming the French Revolution. So Edmund Burke got very excited and thought this is terrible, you know, how could they? At that time, the democracy Edmund Burke was defending had a electorate of 2% of the population. Ah, interesting. Two percent of the population. Only two percent of the population. You have to pay a hundred pounds in rates to be able to qualify to vote. And so the House of Lords was, of course, full of lords, uh, hereditary lords, and the House of Commons was full of younger sons of lords, or the oldest son was waiting for the father to die so he couldn't want to. So, in a sense, it was very unrepresentative, and the constituency was called rotten boroughs and pocket boroughs because, as a lord. I would own a lot of villages, and in villages there would be three or four voters, and I could sell you the seat. Uh, Ricardo had a seat uh, in Parliament with six voters, uh, so you just give a nice party to the six voters, and they vote for <laughs> he you. He had six voters. Uh, six, six voters. Six. Six, six. Wow. 
six voters in that constituency. So they were called rotten boroughs and, and, and pocket boroughs. Pocket because they were in pockets. Oh, that oh, so that's the origin of the term pocket boroughs. Yes. That parliament was basically what Burke was defending as a great thing about liberty, for God's sake. And it is that parliament that Malthus was trying to defend. So you mentioned Burke. Burke has this famous line, and I'm quoting from memory, the age of chivalry is gone. This he said I after know, the I French Revolution. And he puts economists... Among, among the bad people. The bad people. The age yeah. of economists, uh, money lenders, something, like that, yeah. calculators, economists, yeah, yeah, yeah. and sophisters yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Is, is on, and the age of... Yeah, well, the glory it, of Europe yeah. is gone forever. You see, they were... The, the, the people who were the landed interests in all, you know, like, like someone like Malthus, he went to Cambridge, did a mathematics degree, right. his father was rich, his father was able to buy him a, a priesthood for a parish, ah. uh, and that's why he's Reverend Malthus. Uh, and so he was worried that the mob will come and increase tax. So I'll come to Malthus in a second. Let me go back I, because I don't want to lose Adam Smith for a minute. No, because, no, no. Okay, yeah. you know, as Whitehead famously said, the history of Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Similarly, it may be said that the history of modern economics is a series of footnotes to Adam Smith. Absolutely. And there's a reason because he wrote not one but three books. The third was published only 200 years after the first one because it was a series of lectures that he delivered. This was his lectures on jurisprudence. And that is equally important as compared to his other two books. One, of course, is The Wealth of Nations, which every schoolboy or schoolgirl today learns, you know, is the foundation of laissez-faire economics that we just talked about. But then the second book, which is, so laissez-faire economics is taken to mean, though it is not, as an unfettered defense of free markets. But the theory of moral sentiments provides a very natural corrective to that. And yeah. then, of course, the lectures in jurisprudence, with its discussion of slavery and everything, puts the whole world in a proper context, something which is missing if you just read The Wealth of Nations. Would you care to talk about why Adam Smith is so central? And you mention all three of these books in your yeah. book. You see, Adam, Adam Smith has got a very bad reputation from the people who support him. They have maligned him. Mujhe as, apne as a, a, a anti-state right? anti man and anti-public spending man and anti-poor and so on. In the 1950s, I was told, uh, you know, the free market, uh, the invisible hand of the market uh, picks your pocket. Uh, and that, that was an Adam Smith thing. Now, Adam Smith, of course, was a philosopher. He wrote this book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And then this lectures on jurisprudence, and then he wrote an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. May, may I stop you here? One of the very interesting metaphors in that book is the metaphor of the pin factory. Absolutely. And, and why I mention this right now, by the way, the great thing about a great book is that you find uh, pearls literally on every page, and uh, this is one of them. Yeah. And today, if you want to see exactly what is happening with the Apple supply chain in China, right, and exactly how complex it is, and the Financial Times had a series of two very large articles last week about the complexity of that, uh, uh, of that supply chain, and it was just as if, you know, pin factory, pin factory reprised. Yeah, yeah. Would you care to say something about that? No, I mean, the, the interesting thing about, about Adam Smith is that he... Uh, he is in an age where the Martin Luther has happened and the Catholic and Protestant churches are divided. And there's a huge uh, movement to use reason, rational thinking, and, and not accept authority. And the one question was, could you have a morality without fear of God? Morality without the fear of Morality God. Morality without the fear of God. Could you basically be, be a good person, a trustworthy good person, keeping their promises, even if you're not afraid that God will punish you if you go wrong? What is the mechanism? And so Adam Smith doesn't say that. Adam Smith is very clever. What's his answer, though? What's his answer? Well, I'm coming to so Adam Smith is clever. He, he was sort of not quite an atheist like David Hume was, but he was a deist. I won't go into what deism is. But he never declared his doubts about religion. But he said, basically, there is something called an impartial spectator. 
the impartial it's so is this like the I, our conscience our conscience is watching us and our conscience tells us that if you want to enhance your self interest it is in your self interest to look after the self interest of the others interest every person needs other people to serve their self interest and it's only by mutuality of self interest which is rational for you to to look for your interest in other people's in order for a market to work or any system to work without constant supervision and regulation you know sir but colbert thing you didn't need all those uh, all the barriers uh, at districts and so on trust people to go and look after their own grain uh, harvest and sell it in the proper place don't restrict them now so the mutuality of self interest which is enhanced by just people looking after themselves and others you need to move the microphone closer sorry uh, the, the mutuality of self interest is what he actually paints through the uh, vehicle of impartial spectator and it's a, it's a it's not an easy book to read but it's a great book to read and that establishes later on the basis of why exchange would work you see exchange is very interesting exchange is always between people with equal legal status it's voluntary yes it's not like slavery it's not like serfdom nobody tells you to exchange you go and bargain and haggle and then you move to another shop you know you don't like the bananas this man is selling you go to the next shop and you finally settle when you are satisfied that your self interest is good and the seller agrees with you and so so, so that, that is a complicated system which establishes a free market so there is also a remarkable passage that you quote uh he says and remember he is in britain and 1776 by the way is two anniversaries right it's the freedom it's the liberation i mean it's the freedom of america and it's also the publication of the wealth of nations 1776 and and, and sorry and james what did his first steam engine experience in 1776 in anniversary. glasgow right so and this is a remarkable statement that you have in your book he said that britain would be better off if it voluntarily gave up its colonies Yes. Say a bit more about that. I mean, it, it's a remarkable passage. This is war is going on. He is he is sitting in his, in his village in in Scotland writing Wealth of Nations, but people are consulting him as to how England should deal with America. So his idea is sign a treaty, you know, of trade treaty. Leave Americans to do, and they'll be so grateful. They'll always be your friends. and he actually says and in the f- future they're not they will really help you in trade but also in war and other things precisely what happened in the first and second world war interesting and the man was talking about it in 1776 so i want to give back i i need to talk about malthus now malthus you know uh, sadly we'll talk about malthus yes <laughs> misery malthus yeah misery malthus but yes. before i come to that very interesting factoid see the history of british political economy and political economy in general because that is where it began is tied up with india uh both james mill and john stuart mill were mulazims you know of uh, the east india company but also i didn't realize malthus malthus s- served as a professor at haileybury college now for those who may not immediately recognize this term just as the east india company was the world's first global multinational enterprise they needed trained managers so they created a management school yeah and that is haileybury and haileybury basically produced the writers you know in calcutta you have the writers building it's not because they were writers as in novelists or non fiction writers they were writers because they wrote dispatches at home you know dispatches home they were basically the steel frame of the east india company and that steel frame was trained was trained in haileybury college Absolutely. which was disbanded in i believe 1848 after the indian war of independence or mutiny as the british called it so 
Malthus was a professor there. Can yeah, you say? East India Company had a, a trained a better civil service than was available in Britain <laughs> itself. Britain itself had corruption in people appointed. East India Company saw to it that only qualified people went to India. Interesting. So why was that? Why was it that the British civil because service was not as good as the Indian civil the, service? They were spending their own money and they were not going to waste their money in, in appointing in corrupt uh, sons, of, uh, sons of peers, you know. So, right. no, so it's, a, it's a very enlightened thing, East India Company. I, I know. Uh, I'm not supposed to define East India Company in a, a Jaipur Literary Festival. But uh, I think, you know, you are uh, Britain's civil service reform when East India Company ended, and that reform was brought back to London, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Trevelyan reforms, the North Coast Trevelyan reforms were in UK in 1850s after East India Company shut down. Now, one thing that struck me, uh, you mentioned, I believe this is on page uh, 138, that political economy had no serious discussion of slavery. Now, this is the interesting thing. This is the beautiful whitewash that the British did. That is, they whitewashed everything that, all the evil that they had done, and they had they whitewashed all the good that existed in Indian civilization. And one part of it was they talked endlessly about caste. And uh, James Mill, his book comes out in 1818, when slavery is still legal in the British Empire. And he has the gall to criticize the Indian caste system. You know, he talks about oppression of women, caste oppression, and a few other things. And he sets the narrative. But what is interesting is that while this is happening, he takes no notice of slavery, which is pervasive. And in fact, all the great buildings, including the one where you happen to yeah. uh, spend your afternoons, that is the House of Lords, was all built on the back of slave labor. Indeed. And you mentioned this extraordinary statement, no serious discussion of slavery in political economy. Yeah, you know, it's, it's well, partly because, uh, in a sense, you need to be closer. It's, born, it's born in Europe, and Americans come rather late to, uh, uh, to do this. So, there was no slavery, strictly speaking, in England. Slaves, England traded in slavery from West Africa to the Caribbean, but in uh, England itself, there is a judgment by Lord Mansfield, which said that slavery is not allowed in England. Yeah. So they then abolished trade in slavery, and later on, it took another more years for, of course, slavery to be abolished in America, the right. Civil War. And, of course, they compensated uh, the yeah. slave owners handsomely, including Absolutely. the uh, William Pitt, the senior, got 80 million pounds, if you can imagine that, in today's money you see, uh, you, for the manumission of slaves. What they did, they think of slave as like a machine. A slave produces so much each year, and therefore the capital value of a slave is equal to the annual output divided by the rate of discount. I can, I can do it on a blackboard if, if yeah. I had it, but I won't. <laughs> so I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, things with you for another few minutes. Then I want to leave a full 20 minutes for Q&A because I'm sure that you'll, your questions will be much better than mine. So my job is to just to make sure that they, that they, have, that they, that they are recognized. So I'll just very quickly conclude very, uh, the subsequent part. You talk about, so let me come to Marshall, Pigou, and Keynes, yeah. the Trinity, so to speak. Uh, what is your uh, take on these three? Because... You see, Malthus, Malthus is very important because everybody thinks Malthus is a great expert in population. You know, the population goes geometrically yeah. and food grows arithmetically. It's completely invented. There's absolutely no evidence for it whatsoever. Because he's a mathematician, he says, oh, you know, uh, Euler has got these tables of compound interest and so on. He says, therefore, population doubles every 25 years. There was no proof, given the population numbers available when he was living, that that was the case. And he cites somebody, an older, uh, you know, William Petty, he says, Petty says that. Petty doesn't say that. I've checked it, yeah. and Petty doesn't say that. Petty says, 
population in England doubles in 500 years. So, by the way, he, he gets... Was, he was worried about... And let me just say, well, at that time, there was inflation in wheat prices. And the, the idea was wait, wait, that every wait. parish... Sorry. So, I, I want to pick that thread. So, he says... You mentioned that he got the population thing wrong. And he says... He does not directly admit his error, but noted the new result with an air of expertise. So it's like he made the mistake, <laughs> but he he just has an air of expertise around it. Absolutely. And he says what what, uh, what was going on at that time was the last five years of the 18th century. Prices started rising in England of wheat. And the idea at that time was that in any parish, if you were unable to work because you were disabled or older, the church looked after you, they collected money from the, from the well-to-do and fed you. The worker, who was able-bodied worker, got a wage. The wage was sufficient for the family. Now, when prices rose, the wage did not rise. So they had to put it on rates. And Martha started complaining that these working people, able-bodied working people, were being given rates. And that was terrible because if you pay them more money, they'll only breed more children. Got and it. And therefore, they will cancel out any benefit to them. Keynes, what, what, uh, you have a whole series of vignettes about Keynes. Would you like to comment? Uh, he's central to, as it were, uh, a whole new way of thinking in economics which takes over yeah, from well, the classical yeah. economists. Okay, so, so what my book basically says is that the idea of economics that if you pay poor people more money, they'll only breed more children, so that is self-defeating. And you should pay money to the rich. Comes from that time of uh, a small minority running parliament and so on. It's not until universal franchise is uh, established in England in 1928 when women get the full vote compared to men, that the possibility of a progressive economics arises. And so this man, Pigou, writes it. But then Pigou's contemporary and fellow Cambridge person, Keynes, changes the discussion to full employment. And everybody forgets about redistribution. Everybody's worried about full employment. And Keynes, Keynes and revolution and all that. And we all got diverted into some other kind of economics. And then you, you have this massive sweep, right, from Keynes, from the time of Keynes, 1936, yeah. to almost actually more than that, all, all the way up to 2008. In some sense, Keynesian economics yeah, held absolutely. sway. And so then in 2008, there is because of the financial crisis. Exactly. There is a whole... There's a whole re-examination. Well, most of my professional life, I have fought the Keynes versus Friedman battle yes. uh, in inflation. And at the end of it, 2008 crisis happened, and we all forgot about Keynes and about monetarism because they all failed. Nobody predicted that crisis. You know, Queen Elizabeth of, of the sainted memory went to LSE to uh, inaugurate an economics building. And she said, why didn't anybody warn us that this was going to happen? And, and you know, the economist said, well, none of us expected this to happen. It was not in our theory. And therefore, th that's what happened. So at that stage, all those discussions were irrelevant. What we have to worry about is how to take care of people and how to save lives and livelihoods. This is why I wrote the book. Forget about all their games and inflation and all this stuff. Worry about people's lives and their livelihoods and devise an economics which will value people, not things, which will value people and people's lives. And nice. That's, the book. that's what the book is about. So let's open up the floor. I may come back to you with a question or two, but I see a lot of hands going up. So Let me, let me give one Indian example before I go for Yes. You know, during lockdown... There were people walking from New Delhi to Bihar. Yes. Right? Why? Because they could not claim benefits unless they were in their voting constituency, then they could have Manrega. Think of that and compare to all the non-performing assets of nationalized commercial banks, the amount of money which were lost in that. 
We don't even know where that money went. And that money did not disappear. That money actually financed a lot of very, very rich people and it has not come back into the government coffers. But you cheat on Manrega and you'll go to jail. So let me, so please raise your hands for, for questions. So I see the gentleman there in the, uh, yeah, right there. If you can. Yeah, he had raised his hand. It's Makaran. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, sir. I'll so, talk to you next. So there was an Oxfam report that came out when the World Sorry, Econ which report? Oxfam report. Oxfam report, yes. The World course. Economic Forum study, since you're talking about inequality and all. So, uh, I mean, this gap has widened and in fact precipitously widened for the past 10 years between poor and richer. So where is this country brutally going wrong? Because, I mean, one thing is for sure evident, riches are getting richer. But this one more thing the country is doing good is getting poor, more poorer. So what do you say about Rich that? Rich are getting richer, poor are, poor are Thanks. getting poorer. Sorry? So no, no, I, no I, it's, you know, it, it's not that simple. It's not simple. It's, it's, the problem is that uh, actually in India, poor are not getting poorer and, and I, I won't go into that. Uh, the problem is why does economics value the idea that the richer people should be given income tax cuts because prosperity comes out of how they behave. And why it does think that we have to watch budget deficits and not give too much money to the poor because if you do that, the economy would be ruined. Right? That, that, that's a very standard idea of sound economic policy across the world. So, can it And my question is, where did that idea come from? So John Kenneth Gal Galbraith had a very nice uh, metaphor that he used for that. He said, this is like the belief that if you feed enough uh, uh, oats to, uh, to a horse, some will come out at the other end for the poor people. So, <laughs> so I think that was his, uh, so for the sparrows, as, as he said, this is the horse and the sparrow theory. Makaran, you have a question. First of all, congratulations on that book. It seems to be a really fascinating survey of the major economists and also a way to make them familiar to us because most people don't understand economics. They think it's just numbers. So my question relates to, you know, the starting point of your discussion where it seems that Adam Smith's book was a subset of morality, you know. It comes out of that. Now, I want to uh, bring up, uh, you know, John Ruskin, because Gandhi was very influenced by him. And when we talk about lives and livelihoods, unto this last, antodai, all these ideas are also similar to the original idea that economics is a subset of morality, justice, piety, and, uh, yeah. uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, our conscience is our witness, and that is the way to organize lives uh, and livelihoods and uh, production and distribution. So does John Ruskin feature in your book? And uh, yeah, thank no, you. You see, the, the problem with John Ruskin is that contemporary movements at that time, what about industrial workers trying to get a better wage deal? They were not against industry. They wanted industry and because only industry could guarantee them a higher income. John Ruskin didn't need any income. Uh, you know, I mean, both, both Gandhiji and John Ruskin wanted to glamorize poverty. And poverty is not glamorous, I can, I can tell you. Uh, poor don't find poverty glamorous. So it's one thing to, you know, for, for, for basically Gandhiji, accept poverty, avoid machinery, avoid the word that. Luckily, the Indian, uh, uh, independent movement rejected that. Say thank you very much, but you know we will worship you and think of you twice a year, <laughs> and that's it. But you know don't 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 tell us anymore. So I think Ruskin is a very minor person in the movement of of people for a redistributive political economy because they want to be dividing the wealth which is being created by machinery. They don't want to reject the machines. They don't want to go back to Oliver Goldsmith's deserted village, you know, which is very romantic. But they don't want to go back to that. They want, they want modern equipment, the modern cities. They want modern transport. And they want justice. So the idea is you have to have justice with machinery 
with modernization because we can't go back to nowhere. So we have one question there, then here, and then the lady there. Yeah, go ahead. And then the second mic can come here, and then third, the lady is there. So if you can move there, that will save us some time. Yeah. Good evening, Meghna. Good evening, uh, Shailendra. And very brief. My, 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 my question is, but the first question is... No, only one question and very yes, brief, please. Yeah. yeah. Very brief. It. It's a, it's, it has all the elements in it. My question is, uh, you being a Guju, <laughs> and the two Gujus ruling this country, what is going to be your suggestion over Dhokala and Masala Chai to them? Sorry? Well... <laughs> Your, your opinion of Dhokla and Masala Chai. Well, thank you. Well, what he is said, going to be your suggestion to Narendra Modi and Amit Shah, who are the duo who are... He said really your, your economic advice to... Uh, your economic advice. Yeah, we got the question. Yeah. Thank you. I think, I think, your advice to Mr. Modi and Mr. Shah. Yeah. I think when Narendra, when Narendra Modi needs advice, I will tell him. <laughs> so the second question here. Go ahead. And then the lady there, if you can get the microphone there. Yeah. Thank you, Lord Desai. I find your views on economics as fascinating as your exploration of Lord Krishna. Uh, my question is, it's fascinating that you point out that economists should not be looking at metrics of the past, otherwise the mistakes of the past will keep continuing. Is it time that we moved away from metrics that carry on that disease? Should we move away, for, for example, from GDP to something which is an indicator of magnificent human capability? which will get politicians to look at economics differently because today it seems... Uh, I think we got your question. Yeah. So his question uh, sends capabilities approach maybe. Your, your thoughts. You see, well, my, my, you know, basically in India today, there's a lot of optimism. I always find optimism very upsetting uh, because I'm, I'm not naturally very... Uh, I'm very worried. You know, everybody's talking about how soon India will catch up with being the richest country and so on. And the total GDP would be very good. But what's the total GDP about? What's the per capita GDP, right? India is the fourth largest total GDP income, but it's 151 in per capita income. So let us value societies, first of all, by longevity. My say a bit more about that. That is your idea in your final chapter, right? Yeah, my final chapter is basically not, not life expectancy, but how many years I have got to live if I am such and such age. What is my expectancy of extra years to live? Because, you know, uh, as long as, you know, you're alive, possibilities are open. Wait, so this you has... Know, John, John had the... Yeah. yeah, no, please. Please finish your thoughts. So, and so first thing is to value life and likely longevity, then look at income, but look at income adjusted for inequality. Because what is my stake in society depends upon where I will end up in the inequality thing. I can't just say per capita income is my income. So let us find out what is the possibility that we can offer to people over the next 10, 15, 20 years. So this is, and that's how you value society by calculating that. So this is, by the way, uh, yes, a big round of applause for Lord Desai on this. But the interesting thing is that this is fleshed out in great detail in the last 10, 15 pages of the book. Uh, it requires a blackboard. That's why I'm not going to attempt to try and uh, get him to summarize it here because that will raise more questions than it answers. So the answer to that is to actually buy the book and read it uh, from the back uh, all the way up to the front. Yeah. The lady there has a question, and then I'm going to ask a couple of other. I see t uh, one lady here and one gentleman there. So we'll have three young people uh, asking yeah. questions. So over to you so first. So my question is, uh, the recent Oxfam report actually uh, highlighted how the poor in this country pay a disproportionate burden. They have a disproportionate burden of tax. For example... The poor like pay, have a disproportionate burden of tax. Yeah, like the 50% uh, of the population is paying more than two-thirds of the GST and then there are some 80 million people who are dependent on the government for free ration. My question is if uh, because of the government policy there is a systematic destitution of poor people, why do people continue to vote for this government? Well, well, the, you know, you know, no, 
no welfare state is perfect. But in India, given the nature of democracy, in, remember the poor vote much more regularly in India than they vote in America or UK. Because traditionally, well, the Indian state has always been welfareist state. Not as much as it should be, but actually, in the last 25 years, the Indian state has become much more efficient at looking after the poorer people. But it is not perfect. I agree with you. And I, I, I cited the case of the person walking from Delhi to Bihar. Because in a better welfare state, you would say, wherever you live and you are unemployed, we will give you relief there. You don't have to go to your village and claim Manrega. We will give you an urban Manrega. I, I, I did propose it at that time, but we, I won't go into that. That basically, if you're guaranteeing 100 days to somebody in the, in the village, you guarantee 100 days work to somebody living in an urban area, no harm would be done. And what's more, ultimately society pays for ill health. Society pays for short lives. Society pays for deprived children. And you will save all that money being spent if you give people proper living, even when they are not employed. Because ultimately they will spend the money and it will come back to the economy. Right. And by the way... They're not going to run away. One partial answer to your question is this government runs perhaps the largest welfare scheme yeah, in the absolutely. history of the world. Yeah. With, 90, uh, with 900 million people getting free ration, rations or subsidized rations. This gentleman here, uh, the lady here, let's go with her first. And then there was a gentleman there. Yeah. The lady in the red. So it seems like a follow-up question to her question. I was going to ask that, do you think new Keynesianism is making a comeback with all the large set of schemes that we have, not just in India, but all over the world? and sort of kind of indicating right while going left. The new Keynesianism. Hmm? Is new Keynesianism making a comeback? Utilitarianism. Keynesianism. New Keynesianism. New, new Keynesianism. Keynesianism. Well, you know, I don't actually uh, know what, what the broad point is. I'm not interested in Keynesianism. Because I'll tell you why. Because Keynes, while talk about full employment and all that. We had Ronald Reagan distribute income towards the rich. We have a Keynesian in economics along with unequal redistribution of income. So I said Keynes is not enough. Keynes is necessary but it's not sufficient. We have to have full employment and a good distribution of income simultaneously. So I'm not saying Keynes doesn't matter but Keynes diverted attention from Pigou and diverted attention from redistribution. I want to get back to redistribution because I want people's lives alive. You know, it, it's, a, it's a pandemic truth that lives and livelihoods matter. If you neglect them, you suffer. You, you punish a lot of people. So don't worry just about full employment. Worry about more than that. The gentleman there who's raised his hand, the gentleman there. Hi, sir. Thank you so much for the talk. I just, um, as a young student of economics, I want to get your sense of, so while it's good that we're recentering the focus of economics on people and people's lives, where do you think the agenda of sustainability and environment fall in, in the same context? Do you think it's in collaboration with recentering the focus of economics on people's lives or is it in, I don't know, uh, competition with it or where do you think, do you think it's, it's, it's still important because as a young student of economics, I still don't see, I mean, uh, any, any more discussions or conversations on this as well, so. Sustainability, and you have a chance, yes. you have a whole blurb on Green Pigu, right? Yeah. Well, I, I did not go into the question of sustainability, partly because it would require a whole different book. But I do point out that Pigu, A.C. Pigu, writing in 1913, is a green economist. He actually talks about why we are wasting resources for small gains and we are neglecting, uh, we, are, we are killing fisheries, we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are wasting energy and so on. Now I think the question of climate change, climate of sustainability is a very big question. And we haven't actually solved it. 
We know the problem, but we haven't actually solved it because solving requires a much fundamental change in our life patterns than there is. You see, the problem again is that as between the rich and the poor, the preferences are different. The rich countries are very happy to, to go green. But the poor countries want to get some, some richness before they can go green. They can't go green now. And so it's, it's very difficult. I think, in my view, progress has been very slow. And progress will not be very large because there is no agreement between the rich and the poor as to what the priorities are. So China and India want to go on burning coal because coal is, coal is valuable to them. Of course, in the UK, they are no, no, no longer had any coal mines left. Now, UK can afford not to have coal, but China and India can not afford to have coal. What is the choice? So, I think the economics of climate change is much more difficult than people think it is. It's very much like getting a welfare uh, state where the rich and the poor agree that the policy is right. The rich one different than the poor one. Now, I didn't get into that because that will take a whole book. I, I've written on it separately, but I didn't want to disturb this particular topic with another huge topic, which would, which would, uh, for which I don't actually have an answer yet. Okay. The, 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 the lady, I know young why lady, it can't be done. I don't know how it can be done. The young lady there will have the last word. Yes. Thank you, sir, for uh, such great insight into subject and economist. I'm being a student of economics myself and uh, currently taking the previous question forward like um, sustainability, how economics and sustainability go together. So uh, my current um, research interest little bit your, is your, your question, your question, happiness, please. sorry, happiness um, and economics or well-being economics. So um, uh, India as a developing country, are we ready for this concept? Like this the is, happiness, con happiness yeah, index, happiness right? Index your your thoughts on the happiness index? No. You know, I, a I, clear I, no. I, life, life, is, life is too short. Life is too short. You know, I am I'm old-fashioned enough to think. I, I have a very good colleague of mine, Richard Layard, has done a lot of work on the happiness index. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not... I don't think we are about happiness. I, I really want... I want lives to be sustained and people to be healthy, whether they're happy or not, I don't know. It, people, people can be miserable and very rich, people can be, you know. I, I, I basically, the happiness is not my subject. If it becomes, I'll write another book about it, but right now I'm not writing a book about happiness. <laughs> Life is too short. So with that, we come, we come to the end of a magnificent session. and. Uh, uh, and I'll close essentially by saying that this is one of his 40th book, right? Over a 50 year academic career. So, and also, also that he's a master storyteller in part because he's fascinated by Hindi films. And one book is about, the, about Dilip Kumar and how the first, the 10 major roles that he uh, portrayed on screen were a synopsis of the Nehruvian era. So I hope you will continue that analysis of Hindi films and come up with some more insights into economics, into life, into everything. Okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And well, a big hand for... Thank uh, you big all for coming. Thank you all for coming. A big round okay, of applause. And we thank you, Lord Meghnath Desai and Shilendra Raj Mehta for this riveting session. And we thank Business Standard for their support. Meghnath Desai, if you have his book, he will be coming outside. You can get the book signed by him and have a chat with him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.